All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. It's an educational channel where we focus on great theories of everything, ancient and modern. We do deep dives into them, mainly from obscure sources that you've never heard of before. But if you had, they could change your life, uh, especially in terms of your quest for better spiritual, mental, and physical health, your paradigm shifting, your awakening to 5D consciousness, and your formation of a holistic worldview. Today is the 47th video that we have done on Daniel Ingram's book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. And uh, I think it's helpful to think of Buddhism more as a technology, a process, a science, reproducible experiment, um, and a set of experiences rather than a religion. Um, Ingram emphasizes that you're just sitting there paying attention to your own experience investigating the sensations, mental and physical, and uh, through that, the hard wire of our mind uh, is activated and uh, takes us through certain stages that he has mapped out. Uh, not just him, but uh, the traditions that go back to 500 BC or thereabouts have um, all you know, made maps and um, he's kind of uh, compiled them and uh, contextualized them and tried to make sense of them uh, not only through his 18-hour-a-day uh, meditation practice on retreat, sometimes for months at a time over in the Far East, but also um, imbibing the uh, knowledge and wisdom of the monks living there and other teachers and also just from books uh, and probably also informed by the fact that he's a physician and uh, even though I don't get into his advice about uh, you know prescribing drugs and uh, prescribing psychotherapy uh, some of that informs his work as well. Uh, we are in chapter 31, I believe this is, and uh, it's on the path of insight. Uh, he's giving us the kind of the 16 stages of insight meditation as you go through it. Um, and insight meditation is one of the three trainings of Buddhism, along with morality and concentration. So concentration meditation will take you into a set of jhanas or mental states, uh, trance states, um, but then, and that is kind of like uh, concentrating on an object. And then uh, insight meditation is being able to uh, be open to all of your uh, six sense doors, your five senses and your mental impressions and to be able to investigate them for the three characteristics of um, impermanence, dissatisfactoriness, and not-self that all of them possess. And by doing that, again, your mind uh, speeds up, becomes more efficient, and uh, takes you through these stages of insight. Um, now, stages five through ten are what he calls the dark night of the soul. And he's gone on a, large, a long uh, explanation of uh, the dark night and how to get through it um, and what to do when you're in it uh, because it's, uh, can be, it can be uh, quite traumatic. It can be easy as well. Um, so it differs uh, depending on your circumstances, I guess. But uh, so stage five is called dissolution. And then uh, you have six is fear, seven is misery, eight is disgust, 
Nine is desire for deliverance. And then 10 is reobservation. And so right here he's talking about reobservation. I'm going to back up one sentence and then we'll start here, here on the paragraph that we left off. There is no medal awarded for having a tough time in the dark night or for staying in it longer than necessary, much to my dismay. At my best and on retreat, I have gotten through dark night territory in as little as about a day and a half. Bill Hamilton said one dark night took him about seven minutes, which is really fast, but it means it can be done. I have had dark night phases that were no worse than the general stress I encounter in daily life in ordinary situations. That said, off retreat, I have had dark night phases hit hard for months, those being before I knew anything about what they were or how to deal with them. Contextualization, explanation, normalization, and the empowerment that comes with knowledge and well-applied time-tested techniques make a huge difference, as I have noticed by doing the experiment myself many, many times and as many others have reported. One of the more bizarre potholes we can fall into in the dark night is to become fascinated by and identified with the role of the great spiritual basket case in all capitals, uh, at least the first letters capitalized. I am so spiritual that my life is a non-stop catastrophe of uncontrollable insights, disabling and freakish raptures, and constant emotional crises of the most histrionic nature. My spiritual abilities are proven and verified by what a consummate mess I am making of my life. How brave and dedicated I must be to screw up my life in this way. Oh, what a glorious, holy, special, and saintly wreck I am. Both my sympathy and intolerance for those caught in this trap are directly related to the amount of time I have spent in that trap being just like them. While we should not try to pretend that the dark night hasn't made us a basket case, if it has done so, Neither should we revel in or wallow in being a basket case, nor use the dark night as an excuse for not being as kind and optimally functional members of society as we can possibly be. Try to navigate the dark night with panache, dignity, self-respect, decency, gentleness, poise, and if possible, a sense of humor which often seems to be the first thing to be sacrificed at its bloody altar. Even a cutting, cynical, and dark sense of humor about your current experience would be better than none at all. But avoid hurting people with it. Feel free to use humor on yourself as much as you wish. Remember to balance all that with some honest humanity. It is actually possible to have fun with the dark night. Just like it can be fun to go on a scary roller coaster or see a scary movie, like the alleviating feeling of a really good cry, like the weird thrill that comes from primal scream therapy. Remember that. Additionally, the practice of remembering the good, true, and beautiful aspects of the world and the myriad kindnesses shown you and others by you and others to literally stop and smell the roses can help a lot to regain perspective. My roses are actually blooming nicely as I write this, with their beautiful fragrance wafting through the open window. This advice is likely to ring cheesy to one in the dark night, but remember this and you will do better. Speaking of doing better and getting away from the crazy and back to the vipassana or insight meditation, I should mention something about the micro phenomenology that I really care about that makes insight practice more than just psychology. The patterns happening from a sensate point of view in re-observation are the pinnacle 
of the third vipassana jhana and a jhana is like a mind state or a trance state um, and uh, insight meditation can be divided into four jhanas as well as the 16 stages and I guess really possibly seven jhanas uh, because uh, three of the formless states can also be um, uh, investigated. Okay, the pinnacle of the third vipassana jhana and because of this have the following qualities. First, they are very broad, very around the back, very on the periphery of attention. That is where attention is naturally very strong in this phase. So go with that first, as it is easier. Allowing attention to be its natural fluxing shape will make this work a lot better than trying to go narrow and forcing things. That would be using a first Vipassana jhana coping strategy at a stage in which it isn't likely to work well. Second, the frequencies of pulses are chaotic and fast. We are getting into more sophisticated forms of more inclusive attention that are starting to broaden enough to include many diverse, irregular, erratic, intricate aspects of reality. Go for that attention wise, meaning go into frequencies of the oscillation of the sensations that appear to be subject and object that are really fast and harmonically irritating instead of regular and predictable. We are talking at least 10 to 18 pulses of sensations per second, if not a lot more. While noting can help if we are getting run over in this stage, if we can get it together to go into broad vibrational complexity directly, we can learn to draw on the remarkable discerning power of our minds. We can notice how fast reality is arising and as reality and comprehension are the same thing in their essence. We can notice that comprehension and thus contemplation can go this fast. It takes an elegant letting go of control and an embracing of that to get what re-observation is trying to teach you. Do not try to power through this. That's first Vipassana jhana. Do not try to go for really tight, narrow, fine, tingly frequencies that are all about a center of attention and not about background. That is second Vipassana jhana. Reobservation comes at the peak of the third Vipassana jhana. It is broad, rich, chaotic, and about the background and issues of synchrony and asynchrony. Background here means those things we typically think of as on this side, as well as those sensations that tend to frame objects in the center of attention, as well as just those sensations that are more in the direction of us. The fourth jhana will put it all together later. So here, you just need to learn the third jhana piece well. The first jhana, the first jhana's linear, controlling, effortful attention paradigm can't go that fast. But reality can. And reality is attention itself. So just embrace that. You need to let reality start learning to recognize that it is already recognizing itself. That's the only way the mind can realize the massive processing power it already ha actually has and embrace a vast and complex world of sensate experience that the limited linear mind cannot possibly track in all its richness and intimacy, sorry, intricacy. This is Vipassana. Notice that every little background sensation already is its own comprehension, where it is as it arose and vanished, and that trying to pretend to be a little point 
in space observing and controlling all that sensate complexity is absurd and just causes suffering. That is the lesson here. That is the three characteristics. And the three characteristics are the key in this stage, as with all the others. Do not get caught all do not get all caught up in my psychological description. They are there to help only if you get thrown totally off your Vipassana game. As soon as you get back on your game, even a little bit, get back to noticing all this come and go on its own, naturally, effortlessly, at a basic, fast, sensate level. This is the most important paragraph of this whole section. One way or another, when we finally give up and rest in what is happening without trying to alter it or stabilize it, when we can accept our actual humanity as well as be clear about the three characteristics of naturally flowing mental and physical phenomena, then there arises number 11, equanimity. So we're finally out of the dark night of the soul and we're to equanimity. Finally, we really begin to understand and surrender to the truth of things. We begin to accept at a deep level the truth of our actual human lives as they are. All the stuff that the dark night may have brought up may still be going on, but somehow it has lost its ability to cause real trouble. Equanimity is much more about something in the relationship to and among phenomena than anything specific about the phenomena themselves. It involves a real down-to-earth honest humanity, a real acceptance of ourselves just as we are. Figuring out how to manage the transition from reobservation to equanimity is one of the big keys to practice. Another key is to be real with yourself and keep up a gentle investigation of the three characteristics while you are being that honest in a broad and inclusive way that remembers something called space. Remember that space is just fine. When in reobservation you may think, this totally sucks, dang, I really want to get to equanimity. Feeling into that yearning, being very clear and honest about how you are feeling and thinking, as well as just continuing to practice makes it all happen. Those sorts of thoughts and feelings are totally normal when perceived clearly as they are. They become the foundation of progress. If they are not investigated gently, at least somewhat at a basic sensate level, you are likely to stay stuck for longer than you need to be, as stated in the seven factors of awakening section. When I mentioned being stuck in hell, this is what that section was referring to. If your practice stays future-oriented, goal-oriented, rather than just being with what is right now, what you wish for will not happen easily. In equanimity, Stage 11, there is a settling in, a rediscovery of what we seemingly always knew but temporarily forgot. Equanimity can have a rough start, strangely enough, as well as some mildly painful and irritating sensations. But the meditator feels that some barrier has finally broken, a weight has lifted, and practice can continue. Equanimity can be such a relief after reobservation that it is very tempting to solidify it into the fourth shamatha jhana, either because doing so is very nice or because of fear of falling back to reobservation, which can easily occur. Now the shamatha jhana, those are the concentration jhanas. So, um, He's saying it's very tempting to solidify it into the fourth concentration jhana and kind of abandon the uh, insight uh, track that you're on. In this, 
many will shift to modes of attention that are much more in the realm of concentration practice, being more about the positive qualities than the three characteristics, meaning that they stop investigating those and rest in the equanimity. However, as I continue to mention, not gently investigating the qualities of this stage, such as peace, ease, and a panoramic perspective, prevents progress and makes falling back to reobservation more likely. In fact, falling back to reobservation is quite common, since important learning takes place in reobservation as much as we may not like it. Strangely, some, way, some may find the openness, ease, and spaciousness of equanimity disconcerting, disorienting, or ungrounding, particularly if they have spent a lot of time being in significantly more contracted modes of being. This may cause some to then retreat into those more contracted modes, such as the dark night, as that sort of familiar discomfort may actually be more comfortable to them in some strange way than the ease and openness of equanimity until they get used to it. Milan Kundera's book title, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, sums up well this surprising but understandable phenomenon. What I call the standard pattern involves people crossing the arising and passing uh, stage, number four, learning, if reluctantly, many deep and essential lessons in reobservation, getting to equanimity, but then falling back to reobservation, learning more lessons of a similar nature, getting back up to equanimity, and so on until the lessons hit deeply and finally equanimity really predominates in its unobtrusive way. So if this happens to you, be as grateful as you can be to go back and learn something that you clearly needed to learn more fully or deeply, such that when you get back to equanimity, that lesson will endure and be better rounded. The first vipassana jhana, mind and body, cause and effect, three characteristics, the stages one, two, and three, is about building up the basic skills of identifying what a physical sensation is, what a mental sensation is, how they are related, and what the three characteristics feel like in practice. The arising and passing away, stage four, second Vipassana jhana, is about seeing these very clearly and profoundly for the object of meditation and its naturalness, naturalness of presentation. The dark night, the third Vipassana jhana, is about these insights coming around to the background and seeing more complex emotional and psychological constructs of mental and physical sensations as they are. The fourth Vipassana jhana, meaning this stage, is about seeing the true nature of even more integrated, inclusive, subtle, and fundamental things such as space, awareness, investigation, wonder, expectation, analysis, knowing, wanting, anticipation, peace, ease, questioning, subtle fear, subtle doubt, etc. in honest, complete ways that cut through the center and include the background and foreground as well. It is also about gently teasing out these strands into the field of awareness, delicately, as though we were trying to coax out something fragile and shy. I think of core processes as those aspects of experience that most deeply form the basis of the illusory sense of a me or this side of an investigator, a meditator, a continuous being, something that could be there to make progress, acquire or attain something. 
Seeing those at a sensate level is the opportunity presented in equanimity. And a remarkable opportunity it is for those who know what to do with it. In equanimity, we can see the three characteristics in a way that applies to the whole field of experience. Everything happens on its own. Everything is shifting and ephemeral. Everything that involves a this that seems to be watching that has this strange tension to it. Allowing that wisdom to come through and show itself naturally is the key. The early parts of equanimity can feel very familiar and normal, like we have remembered something simple and good from our childhood. If we felt weary of the world in the dark night, we may suddenly find that the world is just fine. And we may even become more engaged with and excited about it than before. Again, these potentially radical mood swings can be very disorienting to those with whom we have close relationships. Try to be sensitive to this and their feelings. Confidence returns, but whereas there may have been a Rambo-like quality to it, during the arising and passing away, now there is more of the cool, easy confidence and competence of James Bond or Lara Cla uh, Croft. At this stage, there can arise a tendency to see the world and those in it very strange and unusual ways. Tremendous variation is possible here. One example from my experience intended to convey the general concept. I remember looking around me at all the people on retreat and even at all the chickens, birds, and puppies in the monastery and seeing them all simultaneously as little mush demons, little squat greenish creatures with big sad mouths and eyes but also as fully awakened Buddhas. They were both. In fact, we were both. We were deluded and small, yet interconnected and luminous. I could see in some very strange way exactly how each of them, including me, was caught in the world of form and confusion, trying to find happiness and doing so from such a small and frightened place. And yet all of this was vast Buddha nature. All of this was the natural, luminous, and compassionate divine dance. Such strange perspectives that try to resolve paradoxical insights do not always occur. But this is included here in case they occur for you and perhaps to prompt knowing laughter from those with their own unique stories from this part of the path. More sexual and stylized versions of these experiences can also explain why, explain where some of the more exotic tantric teachings come from, though a sexual component is generally more characteristic of the arising passing away stage. Sometimes the early part of stage 11 can produce a real sense of freedom in the conventional sense. Freedom from cares, worries, even responsibilities and social conventions. We may sometimes feel that we are simply beyond everything. And this is a wonderful feeling. It tends to fade quickly enough on its own, but it's possible to get caught by it if we stop practicing entirely, which is a common occurrence in equanimity. The charge is gone. The quest seems preposterous. We are okay. This, just this seems to be enough. Those who became spiritual fanatics, fundamentalists, or freaks after the arising and passing away and during the dark night may now begin to behave 
more like their old selves, with their spiritual practice being much less of a big holy deal. About damn time. Visions of bright lights may arise once more, but these are more typically associated with the arising and passing away of a stage. If white lights arise in equanimity, they tend to be much more broad, amorphous, and or diffuse than the pointed train headlight of the arising and passing away. Any images that form in this stage are much more likely to have more three-dimensional elements than those in the arising and passing away. Again, as with that earlier stage, the meditator is able to sit for longer and longer periods and begin to perceive clearly. The three characteristics with spaciousness, spaciousness and breadth the big difference is that the arising and passing away is more about the object of meditation and equanimity is more about the whole sensate universe. Though sorting this out at the time is not always straightforward. As the arising and passing away can be so powerful and manifests in many different ways. There is less rapture and more equanimity than in the stage of the arising and passing away. There are rarely, if ever, the spontaneous physical motions and cold breathing patterns that come with that earlier stage. Unfortunately, just to make things confusing, there is often a single double dip state shift into some deeper version of early equanimity in the manner of the of rising and passing away territory with one state shift that may involve an eye blink and shift in consciousness halfway down the breath and the other at, uh, and the other at the end of that same breath very soon after the shift from re Reobservation to equanimity. I should also note that occasionally at the stage of equanimity, I am prone to having an unusually strong memory of something that seems unrelated to what I'm doing, such as a strong vision of some part of my past. It tends to last just a few seconds for me. I began, began noticing the recurrence of this during this phase of the cycle. 